Thank you very much. So after the lunch, I think half of us will be a little bit drowsy sleeping, but I would inform you the news is, I thought it's a marathon, but I think it will be a sprint, because uh, 20 minutes what can you do like with this uh, huge and very interesting topic. There are a lot of information to share. I will try to do that just in terms of like, uh, first I would like to share the uh, different presentation at different age. You know, we all know that ADHD as a hyperactivity, inattentiveness, poor focus, forgetting things, losing things, procrastination, and all these things, everybody knows, yes? Who doesn't know this? Anybody who doesn't know this? So all these things we know. But how you will find these things in infant? How will you find these things in childhood? And how will you find these things in adolescent? And I would like to leave uh, enough time for the management because that's what it's supposed to be. But I will just uh, go through quickly, very quickly, through the simple checklist. So, we have different age groups, we need to the education digital life, the medicinal component, behavior, and uh, trust. Okay, the infancy, as I said, that the symptoms of it in infancy difficult to soothe. These are difficult times. So, as compared to the norm, and the parents who have children before, they probably know that this child is very different. So, less babbling, speech, and poor circuit. Um, symptoms of hyperactivity will be aversion to being cuddled or help. You know, they are making a difficult child. If you try to cuddle them, they are like, they're going away from you and things like that. And the impulsively crying, frequent crying, and colic, the pain, the colic. The colic can be due to different, many reasons, but this is a very persistent and constant presentation. Okay, but preschoolers, so preschoolers, thank you. So preschoolers, symptoms of inattention is a strong will, unresponsive to discipline, some language difficulty, difficulties with structured play, toilet training, and so on and so forth. Over here, I think a lot of us are the mental health professionals, the other are the pediatric, the medical doctors. So I would like to say just one word and move on, is that these symptoms can be confusing sometimes and it's very difficult to differentiate from the normal and the abnormal. Like what it is, because all these symptoms you can see in normal child as well. So I will say a golden sentence. What is that? Is that these symptoms are affecting the educational, social, and important areas of life, and this is the problem. So if some child is a little bit college, a little bit here and there, it's fine, it's not causing problem and not raising my job. Teachers are okay, you are okay, nanny is okay, then I think you can let it go down, focus on this one. So this is the most important part to think about if it is affecting the social, educational, or important areas of life, then this symptom needs to be considered and need a further evaluation. Okay. Um, So, so hyperactivity in preschoolers, they are hyperactive children. In the preschooler, you can see them, they are like often bumping, bouncing, and they are like many scars. Sometimes they come, you look at the child in the knees, or the elbows, and stuff, and also you can look at the clothings, like when they are coming from the school, usually they are like all over the place and they are trying to do that. Uh, here is the one thing, this small short video I have put it on my Instagram is also for the school age. For the school age, I suggest every parent, when the children are coming from the preschool as well as the school age, like the early childhood, when they are coming from the school, always scan them. What is scanning means look them from head to toe. It takes maybe 30 seconds or at the most one minute and it will give you a lot of information from their facial gesture to their clothing and their eye contact and if there is anything you will see it right away. <coughs> Okay, so higher 
activity levels than peers, you know, comparison. So problem noticeable in structured play, aggressive behavior, difficulty going to sleep, motor restlessness, and strong will. This is also a, okay. So dopamine, you know, we all know the dopamine theory. You know, excess dopamine is a happy substance, but too much is psychotic. Like you go in the day dreaming. And you feel that you're protected on one of these, you're dying. So the dopamine is a beautiful thing if you have appropriate. If you have more than everybody will cause you crazy. So no, you don't need too much dopamine. Um, so impulsivity is extreme ex excitability, grass point motor difficulties, fearlessness, and you know, they are very, 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 very devils. Okay, elementary years, failing to pay close attention to the details because there's a little more, more demand from the school and uh, <coughs> not to listen when spoken to, trouble keeping attention, failing to follow instructions and avoiding tasks and so on and so forth. So sleep is a problem. Really, many of the parents will notice that these kids are difficulty to put to sleep. When they put to sleep, we know that the hypnobody, you know, public hallucinations and the motor activity before going to the sleep. But in these children, this activity is much more, and the parents are sometimes they come to the doctor and complain about that. There's a too much muscular activity before going to sleep. Okay, impulsivity, social uh, immaturity, frequent arguments, disregards and requirements and all these things, you know, just to give you a uh, glimpse of it. In adolescent, uh, frequently shifting from one uncompleted task to another, like procrastination, starting so many projects and not finishing it up. Um, in fact, I would say one uh, sentence, a couple of sentences to say over here, the adolescent is a culmination of everything what happened in the infancy, in the preschooler, schooler age, whatever happened, like developmental milestone, you know, is a famous lecture for the developmental milestones uh, uh, in, uh, in the children and uh, preschoolers and infants. All those goals, they are not met in their age, like infancy, like, you know, trust us in this, trust that only was ashamed of, and all these. As if they are not met, they will culminate in adolescence behavioral issues and behavior problems. So, in fact, I'm relating this the ADHD as well. All these symptoms untreated, if you go into the adolescent years, it will show because you know, huge body with the little immature brain. Very muscular, very strong, but growing brain is not mature. That's why the decision making is difficult and they can take some kind of uh, uh, some such uh, decisions or action which can be hurtful for them as well like in real life. So that's why the adolescent years, all the things appear up and the parents become all of a sudden very anxious and nervous what's happening. But it has been started through the infancy, infants, preschool, school, and so on. So hyperactivity, uh, you know, maybe a little bit decreased, pronounced feeling of restlessness, self, low self-esteem, because, you know, the ADHD is also co-marked with the mood symptoms. Almost some study says 40%, some 60%, almost of mood symptoms and anxiety symptoms associated with the ADHD. So you might see these symptoms in mix with the hyperactivity, inattentiveness, and impulsivity. So, Continuous peer, poor peer relationships because of the impulsive behaviors, discipline problems, frequent arguments, and so on. Drug alcohol is also a major issue in the adolescence. One more time. Okay. So this is really the parents here with children. Okay. 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 So these are the different hypotheses about it. The low dopamine level in different brain areas can produce ADHD-like symptoms, and uh, study was done in more clients. So I mean, this was the prerequisite for the uh, for the uh, for the ADHD, but now there are people different ways this can be diagnosed later if it is missed early in life. It can be symptoms. Present at least for six months. This is the DSM-5, and uh, symptoms cannot be explained by other conditions. <coughs> so, inattentive type, hyperactive type, and impulsive. 
in uh, hyperactive impulsive type, inattentive type, and combined type, in which the, the, the kids have a both uh, uh, hyperactivity and inattentive. In the, in the girls, the inattentive type is more common, and the boys is more like combined type. <coughs> so these are the comorbidities, the percentage. Okay, living with ADHD during uh, driving during adolescence with ADHD study shows two to four times more chance of accidents during the adolescent and early adulthood. This is very very alarming and it's very uh, kind of uh, dangerous uh, outcome of the untreated ADHD. Other family members with ADHD family history presenting with child with ADHD can be exhausting because of a lot of energy moving around, redirection, and so on. So ADHD in school sit in front, there are a few suggestions, <coughs> extra time, write written instructions, make an eye contact and bring them, give instructions and ask them to read the instructions because oftentimes these instructions are not going <coughs> to uh, inside into their brain. So management. So I will uh, focus on that. Eight minutes, okay. So I think we're pretty, we're pretty good sprint. So basically, I want to focus on the management. So management is not only concerta, retalina, or anything. That this is this is a comprehensive process in which the patient evaluation, the uh, evaluation from the teachers, the, the, the collateral information from anybody who is uh, related to the child, the coach, or anybody else. So all the inf information are very helpful, and the most important thing is everybody should be on the same page. The information should be conveyed. You will not believe how beneficial this is if the teacher, coach, parents, and the therapist, they are all on the same page and try to work things together. You know, the meditation is only part of it. Many people, uh, interestingly enough, so we are much more learned when, whenever the ADHD, the people come with, Dr. Can you prescribe me Concerta? And I tell them, this is not the only thing. The medicine prescription is very easy. Anybody can go ahead and write the prescription and start. And by the way, before writing the prescription, the cardiogram is essential, it's very important to do the cardiogram negative so that. But this is the one part of it. This is the biopsychosocial model, exactly what we are saying. We used to call it for the mood disorders, for the bipolar, for psychosis, whatever. It's a biological disorder. So you need to use the biopsychosocial model in order to have the full, uh, full treatment compliance and the results of the treatment. Only then you can be able to expect something. Otherwise, whenever you give the concerta, they are doing well. When they are not taking it, it's not there. I mean, you can, you have seen these examples, and unfortunately, the stimulant medication also can be uh, can be habit forming. And in fact, somebody if they are taking it concerta for a long period of time, the organs develops. They need a higher dose, <coughs> and they start liking it because it gives you some sort of buzz. Concerta is a long-acting Ritalin, so this gives a less buzz as compared to the Ritalin, which is a jump. Like many people, they will come and probably they have used it before. They will come to you and they'll ask you, "Give us Ritalin, give me Ritalin." Give. So those kind of questions are when they are asking these things. Please don't listen to them. Do your homework. Try to treat yourself. You are the clinician. I don't know how many of you being affected with this in a private practice because over here I know this and my colleagues who I'm speaking to. Who can prescribe medication? The people are asking, give us the data, give us the recording, but you have to educate them, you have to talk to them, and you know, we have to uh, we have to follow the proper guidelines in order to treat the ADHD. So behavior modification plan, as I said, is the most important thing in this. Although in any mental health uh, problem, the behavior modification plan is number one thing. Because just the biology is not enough. If you treat like Anxiety, depression with the medication, this is okay, but unless you do the behavior modification plan and the therapeutic interventions, it will be just in and out. Medication is in, symptoms are out. <coughs> medication is out, symptoms are in. So we need to make sure that they are uh, properly being followed. Rewarding the good behavior is more powerful than punishing the bad behavior. I purposely put this line is that there was a famous study, I don't know how many of you know, because there are two ways to help somebody change or manage the behavior. One is uh, rewarding the good behavior or punishing the bad behavior. Just, so especially in the children and adolescents, there was a study done and that study clearly differentiated the rewarding good behavior is always superior to the punishing. But of course, punishing abuse is like, it's not acceptable anyway. 
So medication treatment, I'll go to that. The stimulant medication, there are two types of, there are many types of treatment, but mainly we are using the non-stimulant and the stimulant. Stimulants are the little in Concerta, at all, which is not available here, and uh, there are other medications. While Stripera, at Moxitin, is a non-stimulant medication, which is kind of taking long time, like usually one month to two months to have the full effect, and initially, if people know that the strata moxetine was introduced for the mood, mood disorders. Later it was found that it's helpful for the ADHD. So it has a, some benefit in the mood component as well, like moxetine. Less, uh, 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 less potent than the stimulant medications, of course, but less side effects. Uh, there are other medication tablets, guanfacine, which is not, uh, I can find it here. If somebody, guanfacine tablets, anybody find this here? I can see it was there is available Jalina. Okay. But in private it's not available. In fact, it is a very, very beneficial medication. When I was in Cornell and we were running the unit adolescent child, <coughs> Tanex was the most frequently prescribed medication. This is a alpha blocker group. So it is helpful. It's a, like the other the version is the Floridan. People may be familiar with this one. But the Tanex glyphosine is much more helpful. For the, for the milder symptoms and less side effects as compared to stimulants and non-stimulants. So I wish if we can find it over here, is, um, it will be very, very helpful. Okay, so these are the few names I have suggested. Methyl candidate, the Ritalin, Concerta, Propylene, Methadate, uh, short acting, long acting, you know, so Deutrana, so, so, many med so many medications which are not available here, but they were in the US just to share the name. If you have somebody from outside, they present you, you can know that, you can always Google it also, you can know that. So these are the common side effects with the stimulant medication, sleep and appetite, you know. So that's why we always give stim stimulant medications in the morning. I say the latest you can take is 1 p.m. <coughs> Because concerta half-life is usually 8 to 10 hours, plus minus with the people returning half hours to 4 hours. So if you give it late in the afternoon, it can affect the sleep. It affects the sleep, sleep hygiene, and all these things, it can create problems. The appetite, <coughs> is the appetite as well. So uh, you might find in the practice, I have seen in my practice, some people are coming in to say that they want to use the uh, stimulant medication to decrease the weight. So I would uh, warn against it. Should not be used for the weight stimulant. There are other ways to uh, do the weight reduction, but please don't prescribe the medication just for the weight. So you can you can uh, you can do that with the ADD or ADHD and give me the concerta recurrent and sleep. No, I would not recommend that. The weight loss is another side effects. So the others are less common side effects because they are stimulants. They can be heart rate and blood pressure. If somebody in adults and they are using and they have already high blood pressure, it should be monitored properly. And then sometimes the ADD plus high blood pressure, the medication may be need to be adjusted. Okay, headache is another less common symptom. Social withdrawal, nervousness, irritability, stomach pain, and uh, you know, few of the less common side effects. So these are the contraindications for these medications with serious heart problems. They are reported case of sudden death with the stimulants. So you know, be careful with the that's why the cardiogram is always necessary. In adults and the patients who are uh, vulnerable, we recommend that if they are on the high dose of uh, stimulant medication, they should be annual cardiogram. If you need, you can have a cardiology consult as well. If you are sure, it's better to be safe than sorry. So secondary side effects may can cause suicidal thinking. As you know, the FDA have to put any side effect which is reported to them. You know the SSRIs that are suicidal, you know, black box warning similarly with this one. Hallucination it can cause because you know all these reasons, the concerta, the ritalin, they can increase the dopamine some way, you know, in a dopamine. Okay, um, I wanted to say just a word about the alternative therapy. Uh, alternative or complementary therapy. So, uh, alternative therapy, there are a few points I thought it would be worth mentioning over here. Uh, if you are considering a complementary effect, you should have a following questions to yourself. So, if it claims to cure ADHD, there is currently no known cure for ADHD. You know, in general, 40 to 50 percent people after being adolescent, they feel better. In the adolescence, the ADHD symptoms have decreased, ADHD symptoms decrease, and they can function. Nobody knows the exact reason, but there are like studies showing that there is an improvement in certain people, so those people they don't need it. Mm -hmm. If they are. If it claimed to be harmless or natural, 
natural does not necessarily mean safe because you, people know that the quinine, the drug which is used for the dermatolite for the malaria, it is drawn from the from the plant, from the tree. So if you somebody take too much amount, it can be like it's a poison very dangerous. Is it offered by only one individual or is it a secret that only certain people can share? You know, then I would be curious about it why it's not. <coughs> Uh, reputable treatment that work well should be available from any licensed healthcare professional. You know, is it based on multiple studies that have been published to confirm the safe safety and benefit of the treatment? <coughs> you know, so these are common sense. Is it expensive spending a large amount of money on a treatment that is that has a not proven or is risky? Is the group of person promoting the treatment an expert in ADHD treatment, <laughs> education, licensing, all these things? Okay, so. ADHD, in fact, everybody can treat ADHD, you know, we know what is ADHD. So it's uh, not hard to diagnose, but of course we need to verify, and when the treatment comes into play, we need to be very, very careful the point I discussed, but it is very treatable. You will see the day and night difference after the treatment. Treatment can prevent complications as well, what we, what we discussed before. 